Hi. So my first painting robots, they were really, really simple. They would, they would pick up a brush and dip the brush in paint and then drag that brush from point to point and fill in areas with color. And um, when I started showing this to my friends, one of them had a funny reaction. He looked at this and he said, you know what, you know what, Pindar, you've, I think you've invented the printer. And, and I took that to heart because, you know, like as an artist, you're always getting critiques. And when he considered my robots just something like a printer, I was like, I got to make these more than just printers. So I spent years doing anything I could to differentiate these uh, robots or painting robots from printers. I added a camera so they could watch their own artwork. Um, and then I, I added a lot of different AI so that they would know what to do with what they saw. I hooked them up to the internet so anyone could teleoperate them. And, um, and then I also programmed them to watch how people were using them so that they could learn. And, and before long, they were doing way more than just printing. They were, I think they were painting with artistic style. Um, just recently, New York City art critic Jerry Saltz reviewed one of my paintings, and I'm pleased to say that he, uh, he said that the robots have good taste. I'll take that as a nice compliment. But also that these didn't look like machines made these paintings. Um, and to get to behind what makes a, a, a painting uh, or a robot that paints a, a piece of art that doesn't look like a machine painted, like I said, there's lots of different AI. My two favorites are that they have the cameras and they have feedback loops. They're watching what they're doing like an artist and making adjustments as the painting is developing. They don't, they don't print something directly out. Another new development that's happening in AI is they're actually imagining what they're painting. So while your printer, you give it a picture and your printer will pick, uh, print that picture, you can see in the top left-hand corner here that these robots are actually trying to imagine the faces that they're painting. So um, here is... Here is one of the faces that it's imagined it's painted recently, and I know this doesn't look like a face, uh, but this robot is new to imagination, and um, you shouldn't judge it too harshly, but you can judge me for making the claim that robots are now imagining things, because that's a pretty big claim, and, and even going to the realm of creativity uh, is saying a lot. A lot of people think that creativity is uniquely human, um, and I used to think that as well until just a couple years ago, and I'm going to do a little thought experiment here, which, uh, which I invite you to participate, where I'm going to ask you to imagine a face yourself, and I'm going to tell you how my robots imagine this face, and then you can compare them and decide for yourself if we're now living in a world where machines are, are imaginative and creative. So to do this experiment, it's really simple. I just want you guys to try and, in your head, imagine a face. Try and Picture it. If you need to close your eyes, do that, but try and pull an image of someone's face into your mind. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that as, as I look up this word I just learned about half an hour ago. So I have no idea what went on in your anterior, superior, temporal gyrus, I guess the place where we have our imagination. But uh, I do know, and the reason I don't know is I just learned this word, but I do know what happens in my robots uh, AI because because uh, I wrote a lot of it and I, I wrote a lot of it based on a paper out of the University of Montreal uh, called Generative Adversarial Networks and like I said this isn't the only AI but this is a pretty interesting one because a generative adversarial uh, network is two neural networks working with each other and fighting against each other in just the right way that some creative things can happen um, so quickly I think we all know what or most everyone knows what neural nets are, but quickly, they're a programming structure modeled on how our brains work. Uh, on the left, you have live neuronal activity. On the right, you have my animation of an artificial neural network, which is uh, a statistical model that tries to mimic that activity. It uses a lot of linear algebra, calculus, and when you feed numbers in one side of this neural network, you'll get different numbers out the other side, and this can do stuff like take this image of a bridge and correctly identify it as a bridge. It's actually become very good at this recently. So the generative adversarial network is two of these fighting against each other. Oh, and I should say those are working with each other. It's, it's actually rather interesting how they do that. But I, the easiest way I've always found to explain this is to introduce them as personalities, the two neural networks as personalities. So allow me to introduce you to the first of the two neural networks, and this one is called the discriminator. Now the discriminator is a highly trained face expert. This discriminator has been shown tens of thousands of faces. It knows exactly, statistically, what makes up a face and what doesn't. So if you showed it a picture of this bridge, it would know immediately that's not a picture of a face, and just say, not a face. 
But if you showed this a, a portrait of my son, it would know pretty quickly that that is a face. So I like to imagine this as an art critic that's really, really good at looking at portraits and telling you whether or not it's a portrait or not. not. So facing off against, or I should say, in opposition to this discriminator is the second neural network. And this one is opposite in a number of ways. This second neural network is called the generator. And I like to think of her as an artist, a free-spirited artist. And the way it's opposite from the uh, discriminator is that while the discriminator is that face expert I was telling you about, seeing tens of thousands of faces, the generator has never seen a face before, has no idea. It's like uh, an artist that's just learning to paint. Uh, doesn't know how to make portraits. The second difference is, well, in the discriminator, you will show it a picture, an image of something, and it'll tell you whether it's a face or not. The generator works in reverse. It starts with the idea of a face, and it tries to paint a portrait. And so, right now, you should be asking yourself, how can a neural network that's never seen a face before paint a face? And it has to get creative. So I'll show you it trying to be creative, and here's the first attempt. It's just a bunch of random noise. I mean, this, we shouldn't be surprised, of course, because this generator doesn't know what a face looks like. Its, it's neural network is just a matrix of random numbers, so it makes a bunch of random noise. The discriminator looks at this for all of about a millisecond and uh, decides that's, where, where's the portrait there. But it does something else that's important. It does a couple of things, but one of the most important things it does is like a critic or a, a critic talking to an artist, it gives the generator a critique and says, Here's the part of your portrait that looked like a portrait, and here's the part that didn't look like a portrait. And in turn, the generator takes the critique to uh, heart and adjusts those random numbers in its neural network and makes it a little less random. So this is an artist, and you know, it's fearless, so it gives it another 80 tries, gets rejected another 80 times, um, gets another 80 critiques, and does another 80 attempts, and it, here's its 80th attempt to paint a portrait. Shows it to the discriminator. Discriminator is not seeing a portrait. Generator is not discouraged. It gives it another 80 tries. Uh, another rejection. Then it gives it another 80 tries. It gets rejection again. But it also, like I was saying, gets critique, and this time it makes itself even more better. At 330 tries, we start seeing something happening. The discriminator is a little confused, but still rejection. At 440, the generator, I mean, I'm seeing images of faces emerge. Discriminator still rejects it. 600 tries, 1,100 tries, and finally 4,000 tries. And the discriminator might say, sure, fine, I see faces. But it took me until I was in high school before I could paint a portrait. And it's interesting to watch this generator go from random static to making realistic portraits in 10 seconds. And um, I don't know what went on in your minds earlier when you imagined your, uh, your faces. And I'm hoping it's not this. Because if this is what you imagined, you're probably a robot or a machine. Do we have any in the audience? All right, good. Now that I know it's just us uh, humans here, I want to show you the part that's really interesting to me as an artist. And the part that's really interesting is, is the very beginning of this process, between 100 and 500, where the faces are just beginning to bubble and emerge out of the chaos. And when I look at these, I see a striking resemblance uh, to my creative process, where when I try and be creative, I try and you know, think up random ideas and refine those random ideas into something that makes sense. And here, when I'm looking at this, I see, I see that the generator is taking chaos, random numbers, and making portraits out of them, pulling order out of chaos. And I think that's a really interesting way to look at creativity and creation. Here's my most recent uh, painting. We finished it just a couple weeks ago. And in it, you can see the robot painting 32 of these faces. And I think it looks cool, but all artists think their artwork looks cool. But this is interesting for a number of reasons, and I think it's interesting for the future because whether or not you accept or you think that the, uh, these, robot, uh, these robots imagining faces um, is actual creativity, at least I hope you admit that, or you can accept that it's bringing order out of chaos. It's turning random static into faces. And even if that doesn't, if, even if you don't accept that, I would invite you to accept that this is a, a creative tool for me. 
as an artist, I can use this creative tool that now makes me more creative as I try and make more artwork. And even if you only accept that, that's a really big deal for everyone in this room uh, going into the future. Because traditionally, artist tools have uh, only made artists more efficient. Like, you know, you think about a typewriter, let's say, uh, a writer, write more words per minute, or a keyboard allows a musician to experiment with more sounds and, and be more efficient. But these new types of artificially creative tools powered by neural networks um, don't just make my creative process more efficient, they make my creative process more creative. And looking into the future, I can't help but think that uh, as more and more of you realize that these artificially creative tools exist, and as more and more people start using them, there's just going to be an explosion of uh, creativity and, and fine art. And anyone who wants to be will be able to pen an interesting novel, will be able to paint a masterpiece. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to paint a masterpiece. Anyone will be even able to compose a symphony. This is very, very soon, there's just going to be a very high level of art, and it's going to become as common as social media posts. And these are going to be produced by everyone, anywhere that just wants to make art. Uh, seeing how much art's coming our way and the quality that I'm imagining it'll, it'll be when, with all these new artificially creative tools that are coming online, I, just, I really just can't wait to see what that world looks uh, like. I can't wait to see what that world sounds like. And, and I can't wait to see what that world feels like. And I really look forward uh, to the art that all the young people are going to start putting out with this stuff. So, thank you.